Welcome to the show, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. And I am really, really looking forward to this conversation with the amazing Gavin Scott, who's joined me on the show today. Welcome to the, to the show, Gavin. Thanks so much, Ruth, for having me. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for being here. <laughs> so for those that don't know Gavin, he is a born entrepreneur with a passion for startup and scale up. He's got over 25 years real estate experience in investment and development. He's also host of the show Stay Outstanding podcast. And he is a brilliant person in the context of looking at your mindset and leveling up your game and getting to that next level of performance and potential. And I'm really excited to talk about that in the context of brain health and how we um, can unchain our pain. But before we do that, I'd love to know what you are passionate about in life right now. Um, well, that's such an interesting question because I could answer it by saying I'm passionate about everything, but that <laughs> might avoid the point, I guess. Um, I'm following my passion at the moment, which is really about raising awareness around plastic pollution in the ocean. So... Uh, I did have the idea of swimming the Gibraltar Straits, which is uh, Spain to Morocco, uh, to help raise awareness. And it turns out that I'm now going to be swimming England to France instead. How, how long is the Gibraltar Straits? Because I, I uh, straight, sorry. The Gibraltar Straits is about 16 and a half kilometers, roughly. Wow. And approximately five hours swimming. The English Channel is double the distance, so it's 34 kilometers, and it's anywhere from 12 plus hours, depending on tide and Wow, current. that's a big difference. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's huge. I, 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 I've kind of walked into this, I wouldn't say by mistake, because nothing is, uh, is ever a mistake, but it, it, it certainly wasn't planned. But I think it just goes to show you the best, even with the best will in the world and the best laid plans, you've got to be in life flexible enough that you don't get set off balance so that you can still go with the flow. Yeah. And hopefully you'll be going with the flow. Will you when you swim? I hope so. But, you know, tides change every six hours. So well, I was going to um, say. We, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. So what I, I'm, what's, I, obviously the plastic pollution is a huge issue. And I read, read this to my daughter um, she's got this amazing book about the oceans. And one of the key messages in this storybook is about not throwing your rubbish in the wrong place and not polluting the oceans. And, you know, she's only three and a half. And she's like, well, mummy, we need to make sure we put our rubbish in the bin <laughs> uh, uh, and not do it. What, what, what has, uh, obviously, we're all really passionate about the the environment and, and making it a better place than the place we've created today. What What is it that you are really, what's your real drive or what's your real outcome that you want to achieve as part of all of this? I just want to take a moment here and say I really appreciate you, Dr. Ruth, because not many people realise that there's something way, way bigger behind the, the plastic uh, war that I'm currently waging, or let's not call it a war, uh, <laughs> the plastic purpose, shall we say, or passion? No, I think it is a war. I, I, I Honestly, I do think it is a war because we're at the war for our health and well-being. And it's not just our health and well-being at a personal level, at a brain health level, but it's the health and well-being of the planet. Well, if we're going to go down that route, then <laughs> we're not even armed to go to war, basically. We can talk about recycling as much as you like. The reality is until there's the cessation of manufacturing of virgin plastic, we are going to be spoiling this planet and the natural environment. And of course, intoxicating ourselves in the process. Yeah, which, um, which usually affects our brain health as well, by the way, you know, with the ingestion of plastics and the, of and the, and the um, uh, putting of plastics on our skin um affects us hugely and it, and it is even being shown to you know we see toxins within the human mm. embryo 
um, that are, are go through through the umbilical cord through from the mother to the child, and we've created an enormous issue um, for ourselves in terms yep. of the amount of toxins we have uh, about in the planet that have been created by by industry. People don't realise how big this issue is, and just how impactful the intoxication upon ourselves is. Um, I do have a link, uh, which I'll give you and perhaps you can uh, put in the show notes or something sure, for, of course, uh, yeah. for sponsorship for the swim and for uh, other plastic causes. But basically, to just come away from the idea of war for a moment, <laughs> I, I, um, I basically was living my life in lockdown, as many of us were in the pandemic, yeah. trying to make things happen, trying to... Yeah things to happen people weren't picking up phones people weren't responding to emails you know they were getting government subsidies and just sitting at home or going out for leisurely walks and still living a very comfortable life and that's obviously not the lifestyle that I've led mine has always been purpose and passion and try and yeah. make the most of it and and you know produce the most that I can whilst I have the time here and so I really felt that I was failing because I was trying to force. And when you try and force something, it often doesn't work in your favor. And I realized that this was the external world that I was forcing. So I thought, okay, this isn't working. Let's go inside. If I can't affect the outside world, let's go inside. And that's really when my own mindset journey started. That's when I would say I had a spiritual awakening. That's when everything changed and I went from a life of subconscious reaction to a life of conscious action. Mm -hmm. um, and we can deep dive into that. And oh yeah, I'd love to do that. A little bit later. But basically I went to every webinar, seminar, course, took on coaches, mentorships of my own, um, and then really began to understand how impactful it is that I started doing my own mindset education mm -hmm. um, with other uh, with others, you know, through my own courses or uh, webinars and inviting people to coaching. So what happened with the plastic was, and this is how it all kind of linked in, which is just a universal energy that was, I don't know, directed straight to me. I was walking down the uh, the beach here in Spain where I lived during lockdown, the second lockdown, and uh, I saw a light somewhere in the sea or on an island. Uh -huh. I, thought, I wonder what that is. So I looked it up and it was Gibraltar. And uh, Gibraltar is a headland. I carried yeah, on I've been to Gibraltar. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting place. It is, it is, yeah. There's it's a lot of monkeys. Small. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then a few weeks later, I was, you know, I walked 10, 20 kilometers a day during lockdown. And a few weeks later, I saw another light. And I don't know why, but I just asked myself, can you swim there? So I started to look at where the light was coming from. And in the end, it was coming from Africa, from Morocco. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Now, why would you want to swim there? I mean, what's, what's this whole swimming thing about? And I've done lots of endurance challenges before. Yeah. You know, hiked mountains, peaks, the whole lot. And I know that you've got to have a why. And this goes down to everything in life. There's people suffering right now with depression that are in bed and they can't get themselves out of bed. And my recommendation to you is to find your why. Yeah. So my why was i got to get rid of my limited beliefs around my physical ability. You know, in the last 10, 20 years, it's always been two steps forwards, five steps backwards in terms of physical progress. Because I put myself in harm's way. I'm a sportsman. I'm an athlete. I love doing adventurous things. You know, I'm always <laughs> ripping tendons or tearing ligaments or whatever. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so I wanted to get over my limited beliefs around that. And then I thought, well, you need something bigger than yourself if you're going to do this, because this is quite some challenge. And, you know, basically, I've been very fortunate. I've traveled all around the world. 
And I thought, okay, well, you know, this plastic thing is really such a big thing. We've got to bring it to people's awareness. And I thought, okay, day one, if you're going to be the plastic police, you're going to fail. You know, no one likes the plastic police, let's be honest. So I thought, all right, well, how do we deal with this problem? And I thought, okay, well, the only way truly to do it is education. Yeah. And then I thought, you know what? Put yourself in the person's shoes that you're talking about. And I realized that when I was in school, I wasn't a great student. You know, I sat at the back of the class, I made drawings, I cracked jokes. And I thought, well, this might not work if, if the person I'm trying to reach is myself, you know, so how are we going to do this? And it was then really that, it, you know, it just went. And I was like, okay, this is what we've got to do. And so basically, I decided that it's through inspirational leadership that you can make huge impact. And, you know, you look at inspirational leadership across the global sort of politics stage and you're just totally uninspired, right? <laughs> so I thought we better do something that is so inspirational that other people are going to want to be interested in what you're doing. And so that was how the swim came together. It was just a connection of mindset wow. and trying to help other people improve their mindset because, you know, on a conscious level or a collective conscious level, if we can raise the game, the general average of humanity, of where we are at the moment with consciousness to a much higher level, then we're going to be taking much greater care of ourselves and of the planet. Hmm. Do you know, I really want to dive into this in the context of mindset and the, and the, and the topic of plastic pollution, because I think it's a really imp important point about how individually uh, we, if we are role modelling the way, we can make an enormous impact collectively uh, around the planet. And, you know, when we look at plastic pollution, um, not so long ago, the supermarkets started charging for plastic bags. So now people have reusable bags or they have Hessian bags or, you know, we don't, we don't have as much of the driver to fill our house up with plastic bags as, as we used to do. So there's been an enormous shift there. That was imposed by the government. Um, and it was imposed, you know, within the UK across different areas. And I'm not sure how much it's changed within 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 Spain, which is where where you're at, <clears throat> where you're living. But we also not so recently, um, not so long ago, sorry, uh, had a an initiative to change um, straws from plastic to paper, mm -hmm. and that was driven not by government by the individual, by the people, and and by raising awareness about the impact of plastic straws on marine life and so on. And almost overnight, it seemed to happen much quicker, the producers of plastic straws, uh, well, the, the supermarkets and so on that would be buying these plastic straws, stopped buying them, and replace them with paper ones because it was no longer acceptable to be causing harm to the planet by um, using plastic straws. And so now lit pretty much all of the places I go to now, I, I can't find a plastic straw anywhere. And that just shows the impact of mindset shift and how individual activities that are raising awareness about what is and isn't acceptable in terms of the health and well-being of ourselves and our planet. When you can create a followership, you can it, it, you can initiate huge huge change. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of pressure groups that have obviously um, been getting to the government for many many years. So it wouldn't have been the government that um, actually made those changes. They would have made those changes because they've been lobbied by those pressure groups. So obviously, one of the most famous of those is Greenpeace, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they do a lot of good work. 
Um, and so, you know, just if there are any pressure groups out there listening, please do keep doing your hard work. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I'd love to dive into the topic of mindset. But for you, what would when we think of brain health and optimal brain health, what does optimal brain health mean for you personally? I mean, basically, you know, it means equanimity, right? Like mm -hmm. we go through life and we react to things. So mm -hmm. there is this consistent up and down. And the more used to the up and down we get, the more addicted we get to it. And we might not admit it but we actually quite like it because it almost becomes ingrained or programmed into our being and although one can surf those waves up and down uh it's actually i would say looking at the general population extremely difficult to surf those waves mm. and what I would say as optimum brain health is living above the 70% line. So people often ask me what stay outstanding means. And I like to describe it as the echocardiogram of life. Mm -hmm. and basically with the echocardiogram, you've got peaks and troughs as with everything we do in life. And so stay outstanding really tries to stay above that 70% line so that rather than having so much space between your peaks and troughs, you have less. And so mm -hmm. what that does is it allows you to stay in a much more tranquil and calm vibration whilst you're making decisions and taking action um, uh, you know about what's going on in your life and when you can do that from that kind of position of calm and tranquility you end up making better decisions basically mm. do you know I really love that is it's like that pendulum swing isn't it you know we have people on the spectrum who <clears throat> may be bipolar which is a huge pendulum swing from one side to the other um, but we all have that swing in our mind and it's bringing it back to a, a steadier state like like you say where you, it's a calmer vibration um, and you can better manage that swing when could you take me back to a time where the the waves were you had big peaks and troughs Just take me back to a time where you weren't optimal in terms of your brain health or or the vibrational state that you were experiencing well i mean uh, there's from my perspective, two very clear traumatic times in my life. Um, one was when my mother passed and wow. I was 18. Wow. And I went off to travel the world afterwards for a year before going to university. And, you know, I didn't really go through the grieving process. Uh, I, Did you try and avoid it? <clears throat> yeah, so basically I became a huge smoker of marijuana mm -hmm. for three to four or five years, all the way through university. Mm -hmm. I just used to smoke a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that was a, I wouldn't even say a daily practice. I'd say it's probably an hourly practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have something affecting your brain, like that and um you can't be making the best decisions it's just not no. possible mm. uh, so to anyone out there that is really pro marijuana i do get it it can help open up your perspective but i don't recommend it once in a blue moon great but you know see outside the box whatever mm. it is but it is actually a toxin to your brain it, it, it makes your brain look a bit like swiss cheese on the surface because it reduces your blood flow to multiple regions of your brain. So it's a similar toxin to other toxins that you, your brain might experience. And it, well, it actually increases, although it's used to treat anxiety, it actually in the long term increases anxiety. 
Um, so they've done a lot. Habitual use of any drug, yeah. uh, you know, will show in the end because what goes up must come down. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you hide in a smoke cloud, as I did for four or five years, uh, eventually you'll come off of that smoke cloud. So I don't know if anyone remembers the uh, the 1980s TV series Monkey Magic. Oh, yeah. I, was, I was flying around on that carpet, except my carpet was a smoke cloud. And, uh, <laughs> it, it, eventually the smoke cloud disappears and you fall off. Um, so that was that was one stage in my life where my brain health certainly was not very good. Um, and when and when did you fall off? At what you know you said you mentioned it was four years. Were you twenty two when you fell off the magic carpet? Or yeah, basically what happened is is I went for another year off after university. Okay, traveling, traveling around the world again. And when you have those kind of experiences and you see cultures and you make new friends and you know you really do open your perspective it's just so so eye-opening and so I didn't need the marijuana anymore to help open my perspective it was being mm -hmm. opened naturally mm -hmm. um, and of course you know after that year of traveling I went back home and found a job and started my career wow okay and I know you said you had a second experience in your life yeah, so the second experience would have started back in 2017, 2018. Uh -huh. uh, it was certainly by no means illegal, but it was certainly immoral by my investors. Mm -hmm. They decided to take my company from me and in doing uh -huh. so made me bankrupt. So uh -huh. I worked for nine years for no financial reward and got the benefit of being made bankrupt afterwards. Uh -huh. And you own the company... But, I own the company. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, it was a property development company. So yeah. they had lent me loans. And our dear uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, um, George Osborne, made a tax change to property, which meant anyone spending above 2 million rather than paying 30,000 tax would pay 300,000 tax, let's say, for a 3 million pound purchase. Okay. And all the properties that we were uh, developing and shortly to sell were in the three to five million pound bracket. Right. So people in that bracket basically just said, right, we're not going to give the government this money. We'll put it in a trust fund for our kids to go to university or we'll put it into an extension and we won't move to a bigger house, you know, whatever yeah. it was. Um, and so we, I couldn't make sales because the market basically went stagnated. And um, they just saw this opportunity to take my my companies away from me. Uh, you know, wow. I was past the last date of repayment for the loans. So they called in the loans knowing that I couldn't repay them. And then, you know, everything else just kind of collapsed after wow. that. So I had about roughly four and a half million pounds in the parent company that I made from other projects with them. Mm -hmm. And that was what they decided to take as well as obviously all the companies. And, you know, reputation and self-worth and self-confidence and yeah. that kind of thing. So I went off after that and I took a sabbatical and I traveled around Southeast Asia and I did a six-month yoga teacher training course in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, on the face of it, everyone's like, wow, Gav, you're living the life, right? And uh, came back to London shortly after and... My dad was like, so what are you going to do now, son, as he's said at various times in my life? And uh, he's got a partner out in Malaysia. So I said, well, you always mm -hmm. ask what's going on out there. Why don't I go out there? So I went out to Malaysia and I was out there for three years. And, uh, you know, I was traveling around the Asia Pacific region, uh, doing lots of different business deals and mm -hmm. having a great time. You know, I just love traveling, seeing new places, meeting new people. Uh, so it all looked great, you know, like what a lifestyle, what a life. And, um, it was only when I went back to London at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. I was actually in Bali at the time. Mm -hmm. I could have, I could have stayed in Bali, but I specifically went back to London to be with friends and family during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. 
And if it wasn't for making that decision and having the time in lockdown to myself, I would probably still be going through the subconscious reaction. Because mm -hmm. during the time from 2017, 2018 until the pandemic, I was just reacting. You know, I wasn't consciously making choices. Mm -hmm. And things can't happen at a higher energy level um, and you can't be the most productive if you are subconsciously reacting. Mm -hmm. I think that's so true. I was talking about it with, an, with another guest, Dr. Ram, about the importance of your belief systems and bringing your subconscious mindset to the forefront of your awareness so that you can change those belief systems and change your, like you say, your reaction to an event that is un often unconscious <laughs> to a conscious action. Uh, and it's, it's different parts of our brain system, right? So our subconscious is typically the deep limbic system and, and the emotional centers of our brain, but our conscious part of our brain is, is the human part, which is our prefrontal cortex. And if we want to take back control of our subconscious, we have to bring it into our conscious awareness. How did you go about doing that? How, what was the what was the journey that you you personally went on to to understand all of those subconscious uh, reaction behaviours that you'd been you know having for quite a long period of time? I don't know, man. How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> I've just basically spent the last two and a half years mastering it. <laughs> um, and it's kind of what I, I I coach. So it's very difficult to say in a short space of time. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's like when uh, my uh, clients come day one, they're like eager to learn. And I'm like, look, you have to understand I've got all this information. I can give it to you all right now. But if I give it to you all right now, you're just going to be overwhelmed. It's like giving you a stack of books that's too yeah. tall to hold and they're just going to collapse and fall out your hand. So there's a process to going through it. And, yeah. you know, through my devotion to becoming a lifelong learner, um, you know, I went to webinars and seminars and, as I said, took on coaches and courses and mentorships and I'm still doing it today. Um you begin to understand that actually it's never finished. Like it's, you can talk about limited beliefs. <laughs> limited beliefs very quickly. Um, you know, they are programmed in and how do you get to them? Well, it's not that easy because you've got to bypass the subconscious because it's going to be telling you something that's probably not true. And what people don't realize is, is we can sit here and go, okay, we talked earlier about my limited belief around uh, my physical ability, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's it, Gav. You're, you're a superstar. Let's go. You can do whatever it is you want. Go run a, go run a marathon. Go, you know, I'm pepped up because I'm saying it, but where's the belief? Yeah. It, it's one thing to say it out loud. And it's another thing to have the belief completely ingrained in you. So yeah. to get that belief ingrained in you, we've got to go to the source. So, for instance, there was a seed planted a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure this is a true example, so don't hold me to this, guys. I might be making this up. But <laughs> I, <laughs> let's take my own limited belief around my physical ability, there was probably some time at school where I ripped a hamstring playing football and the teacher or the, the referee, the teacher, would have said, you're never going to amount to a great sportsman because you're always getting injured, right? Now, we're talking about when I was at school, so that's 20, 30 years ago. So mm -hmm. I actually cannot specifically remember that exact moment. But at some point, something like that would have been said to me and I would have put two and two together with what that person said 
and my injury and connecting those two, I've lived that life ever since. So actually, I've caused myself injuries throughout my life because I've connected those two. So mm. now I need to disconnect those two. So this is really what we call the seed. So yeah. it, with limited beliefs, you can get to the weed and you can take away the weed, right? But unless you get to the seed, the weed grows back. Yeah. And that really is where you build the belief from. Once you get the belief wholeheartedly ingrained in and you get rid of that weed and you get rid of that seed, anything is possible. And, you know, I, I love that analogy because I use a very similar one in the context of trauma. As you, you know, going back to your your experience with your with your mo mother, is it you a trauma tree gets planted in your mind so there's a seed that that gets uh, planted and depending on the state of your mind you can feed that tree that trauma tree and allow the seed to grow if we starve it the seed doesn't have the opportunity to grow so it's about and the, you know that starving the trauma is about having a, 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 an element of resilience um that associated with that, that traumatic experience but it has to be the right type of resilience not pretend resilience and then if you have similar experiences in your life that are very much like the original trauma your your trauma tree gets stronger and it starts growing branches and so you have many branches of the trauma tree so you can you can chop those branches down individually and get rid of some of that trauma but ultimately you've got to get back to the roots of the trauma and the seed and pull the tree out um, from a psychological perspective in order to to get rid of it so it's very similar in terms of our limiting beliefs often you know we might not correlate it with a trauma but it's a it's like having a micro trauma in our mind that sets a sets a cascade of events that every time something similar is going on we re recall that experience and say, well, because, because this is very similar to the experience I have, I have to do this as a response. So I have to react. And then having that opportunity to pause and go, huh, like you said, maybe in my past I had this belief, you know, this belief was formed. I now have the opportunity to unravel it and then break that limiting belief. And, and disconnect the past experience with how I want to show up in the present. And then hence my present will influence my future. That's, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, you know, I, I have so many clients, unfortunately, that want help, but almost can't help themselves because they're stuck in this program. Um, mm. you know, the, it's the resilience game you were just talking about. I just can't get over, you know, every time I make a little bit of a progress, I get hit back and, you know, I mean, depression really is a, 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 a mental illness and it's something else that really needs to be discussed more because mm. I see it in mild and I see it in really strong cases. Mm. And unfortunately, the medical society thinks just prescribing pills will work and that's it's actually it makes a coach's job a lot harder i would say because you know they're not seeing the trees from the from the woods as it were or... no because it clouds the trees so you don't actually see where the trees planted exactly exactly um and so that's that's just completely non-helpful at all but mm -hmm. The thing that really helps is when, and I will share this with you, that gave me an aha moment is what I call a check sheet. In yeah. other words, I will write down my habits or my actions, um, the good and the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And every day I will tick them off. So... In the beginning, let's just take the example of depression because we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. You come out of depression, what you want to do is change the psychology that your brain is selling you. 
And to do that, you need to produce little wins day after day so that you start to get the snowball effect. Mm. It begins to get into a bigger and bigger snowball. Um, and I did this checklist and I saw my habits and I was like, I am causing these things to occur. I am responsible. My actions alone are responsible for these results. Mm. And that was a huge aha moment for me because I could choose to stay in bed, let's say, or I could choose to keep stropping around or I could choose to keep blaming other people or I could choose to not give myself the self-love that I deserve. Um, and it, it was just a game changer because once you see that, once you see that your thoughts become your outcomes, mm. once you see that you are creating those outcomes, once you understand that you are responsible for those results, it, it's game changing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'd love to transition into the five pillars of brain health, which is the framework that I use with my clients to help them understand all of those interconnections. Uh, and we, we, we start by using the, you know, the phrase, let's look at the facts. And the facts is the mnemonic um, that makes up the five pillars where F is for feelings and that our emotions drive everything. A, A is for actions and our behaviours and habits. Uh, C is our connections, and that's the connection we have with ourselves. Often we we have a really poor connection to ourselves. Um, we don't love ourselves enough. <laughs> uh, and also connection to others. So we have to do the deep work internally in order to have a, a better, healthier connection to the outside world with people or with, with whatever it is. And then T is our thoughts. So our thoughts influence our feelings. Our feelings influence our actions. They're all interconnected. And then S is our surroundings. And our surroundings can have an enormous impact on our brain health and well-being. You know, for, for so many different reasons, whether it's the toxins that we've got in the in the environment or the toxic people or, or just the way you've set up your, your workspace or your home space can hugely influence how, how you feel. And that obviously drives your behaviours and so on. So I'd love to dive into it from a fun facts perspective. <laughs> so let's dive on to the first one, which is feelings, um, which is going right down deep into the core of our being. What feeling or, or emotion is the most important to you in life and why? Uh, freedom. Ah. If I don't have freedom, I feel like I'm caged. If I'm in a cage, then I'm grabbing the bars and I'm trying to, you know, aggressively get out or demonstrate that I'm unhappy. Uh, for me, freedom is absolutely number one. Yeah. Um, you know, I just had COVID recently and I was locked away in a room and... Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be a great chance for me to get some work done. You know, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to get all these things off my desk that I haven't dealt with. <laughs> and just the idea alone that I wasn't allowed out of the room just drove me mad. Like, yeah. You know, I literally almost wasn't capable of working, which is really strange from a mindset educator's perspective because you think you can get over it. But yeah, for me, it's freedom. Like, yeah. you know, you take my freedom away and I am instantly one unhappy bunny. Yeah. And and it's really, that's a really important emotion as well because it's that freedom to choose. Yeah, Having that freedom to choose your uh, outcome or what you want to do. But we also have that freedom to choose our emotion in any given circumstance. Well, and so freedom within our, we always possess the freedom within ourselves to choose. It's whether, like you say, you psychologically, you locked yourself in as well as feeling physically locked in. It became your psychological, um, you know, a cage. 
as well because of your environment, which goes back to the surroundings piece. It really did, yeah. Um, I could have dealt with it better, there's no question. But uh, I always say, you know, there's two kinds of people in this world. Those that eat when they're ill and those that don't eat when they're ill. And uh, rather than physically eating in that instance, I was not helping myself by obviously yeah. putting myself in the psychological cage. Yeah, wow. Uh, I'd love to go on to actions because I know we talked about this a lot in the in terms of mindset and how our mindset and, uh, and beliefs drives our, drive our actions and behaviours. What's the most rewarding or fulfilling thing you have ever done? What a question. Uh, 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 <laughs> I'm actually stuck for that one. There's so many, honestly. Okay. Like, it, if you can do something for others where you see the impact and it changes their lives forever, then to me, that's everything. That's a win, yeah. And, and I love seeing that in my clients, you know, is seeing the the shift that they experience through going through coaching, which is why I love coaching so much, is, is just being that guide on their journey uh, and, and empowering them to take back control. And, you know, ultimately, you can't change somebody's belief system they've got to do the change you know can't physically go inside their mind uh and make the changes that the change has to come from within that particular person and i love seeing when that when that happens to other people i i love that can you give any examples of you know really stratos stratospheric shifts that have occurred that have really given you a massive sense of joy um Cross country at school uh -huh. it was always rubbish and slow, uh, <laughs> but I, I just love a challenge, so I took it up and you know, eventually, like, went from 20 minutes down to like eight minutes. Wow, for the course. Um, I would say just going into the world and not knowing anything about the world and, you know, traveling around it on my first year. Um, I would say that was an incredible feat. Basically, any point where I've been challenged. So, you know, I've climbed to advanced base camp Everest. I've uh -huh. summited Mount Kilimanjaro. Right. Mount Fuji. Um, I've done the Three Peaks Challenge in the in the Dales. Uh -huh. you know, anything where you're challenged and you come out the other end and you realise that before you doubted yourself, you know, you limited your capabilities. But when you reach the other side and you realise that actually the only person that was putting limits on your abilities was yourself and you've now yeah. proven to yourself that those abilities don't need to be limited and you can even stretch them beyond the challenge you've just been through, then that just, you know, sends tickles down my spine. Yeah. Do you know why I love that? Because I'm massively on challenges myself and, you know, it really puts you in that growth zone, doesn't it? Because you then have that experience in your memory banks to say, I can do this. <laughs> and then you leverage that experience to the next challenge which means that you can do more on the next challenge because you know you've overcome the psychological. Often when you're doing extreme adventure challenges, it's not the physical capability that inhibits you, it's the psychological. <clears throat> so it's so much about mindset to get to the top. You can see people who believe that they can do it can make huge strides in progress to, to those that may be much fitter but don't believe they're, believe they're capable. So I, I, I love that. Um, I like to dive onto the, onto the third one, which, it, which and we'll finish on the fun facts here, is thoughts. What stupid or crazy thought have you often told yourself in the past that isn't true? It's a good one. Um, you know what? Before I started doing all this mindset work, 
Uh, I had my company, my big company that went bankrupt uh -huh. in my 30s. So when I started it, it was during the layman's uh, collapse and the uh, financial demise there for the economy. But yeah. basically, I said to myself, I'm going to work my 30s and live my 40s. Yeah. And I worked 20 hour days, six and a half days a week. Oh. I compromised and sacrificed on relationships and friendships. You know, most of my friends now are married, have kids, have loving families, etc. And I'm, you know, still out here on my own, wandering the world, as it were. And through that walk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be descriptive and creative in my description. <laughs> but through that walk of loneliness, I created this in this thought or this belief that I wasn't capable of having a relationship or that women didn't like me or, you know, whatever it was, because I was alone. Yeah. I was working 20 hour days, six and a half days a week. And that is just an absurd idea, an absolutely <laughs> absurd idea. Like, you know, I'll go out today and I'll go and meet people and people are just like, who is this happy, loving guy? Like, you know, <laughs> and it, it's just not true, but it comes back to what you were talking about earlier, surrounding an environment and, you know, as I said, subconscious reaction. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, I think that's a really important point. You know, it's very easy for people who are, who are in the single space to think that it, it's never possible. You know, they, they have these limiting thoughts of it will never happen. Like, uh, I'm not enough, people don't love me, all of these negative, we call them automatic negative thoughts. And because they create that closed mindset, that fixed mindset, rather than the open mindset and the growth mindset, that it is possible, they, they, they create an environment where it doesn't happen because, because they've closed themselves down to the possibilities of what is already out there. And so we actually shape our own environment and we shape our own future. We shape, shape everything about us based on, our, on the mindset that we have, the mindset that we adopt. And it's so vital that we recognise that well, I mean, in the context, not just on, over our brain and whole body health, but our, uh, everything <laughs> is your, shaped your by thoughts that. become your realities, right? Yeah. So in the world of... Uh, mindset and law of attraction and cause and effect that's that's all that's happening is you're drawing that into your world so um, mm. you know I just noticed as we were talking that I was a bit slouched and <laughs> uh, you know, I've got bad posture well I've got bad posture because I slouched so what did I do I sat up straight and all of a sudden you realize that you don't have to have bad posture you just have to sit up straight no, and you know what I, you know, I am on a medicine ball here. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> I wish I had one. Uh, because I used to get really sore back. Um, I know this is a little bit off topic, but it's really important <laughs> to say that. Uh, you know, I used to sitting on a normal chair. Um, I used to get really sore lower back pain. Um, I went to see a, a, a physio. Um, and it kept on shifting from side to side, which has also probably had some psychological component to it mm. because I'd previously had back pain as well. So I did some help to unchain that psychological part, but actually strengthen my core to improve my posture on my seat. And I've never had any pain since. <laughs> so it's, you know, we, but it's bringing it to our attention, isn't it? It comes back to what we were talking about previously at the beginning, is bringing it to our conscious awareness, how we are showing up, um, which is, you know, all about the work that you're doing, which is stay, stay outstanding. But we can't stay outstanding if we don't know what outstanding looks like for us and where we sit in the context of that, um, those oscillations that are happening. So, so I love that. I'd love to drive back into uh, your story just for a little bit longer and uh, and discuss, you know, how it how did you 
make the transition because obviously a really successful business person and it sounds like you went into deep depression is that right following the following the business taking your company uh, the investors taking your company away yeah i would say so yeah yeah uh, how how what were this i know we talked about it at the time you said like taking these little steps mm. to move ourselves forward and knowing that's all within your control what were the little steps for you personally that started to build that snowball that you you talked about what were the sort of key things that that helped you come out of the darkness and and see the light well it's quite interesting you know march the 13th 2020 was a really big day for me uh -huh. i uh i went cold turkey I gave up on an addiction and my addiction was coffee. Wow. I was having eight triple shots a day. Oh my uh, goodness. And basically, you know, we talked about what goes up must come down. It was the same with coffee. So I wanted to live in this plane where I was able to make decisions from a, a calm space where I was kind of, you know, flowing or gliding through life as opposed to being in this huge uh, oscillating merry-go-round um, or fun fair ride, however you want to describe it. And, you know, once you are able to become calm in state, you can make better decisions. So that... That really, for me, was the beginning because then I was like, okay, what else can I change? You know, mm. like, I changed one simple thing, not to drink coffee anymore. I loved coffee, loved coffee. I mean, obviously, I said I was an addict. So <laughs> I basically just went cold turkey and every day that went by, I was like, okay, you've done it. You're stronger, you're better, you're calmer. Look at how my decisions have changed today from yesterday. Look at how my decisions this week have changed from last week just mm. because I've eliminated coffee or caffeine from my life. So, you know, this place where you're bouncing up and down is not a place where you can make the best uh, passes in life. So let's just take for a minute a trampoline and you're bouncing up and down on this. Uh, and, you know, you're doing it with intention. Okay, you're not just doing it. <laughs> you're doing it with intention. And you've got a ball in your hand and you've got somebody five, six, seven meters away that's saying, throw me that ball. How well... Can you throw that ball to that person when you are intentionally jumping up and down? You know, you might get lucky sometimes, but none of us are Michael Jordan, you know? <laughs> so, so I would say if you can get to a state where you're just standing on that trampoline rather than bouncing on it or jumping on it, you'll be able to pass that ball to the person. And that ball represents your emotions, your yeah. thoughts, your yeah. decisions, your actions, your outcomes. Um, I mean, it, it's just so clear for people to see when you when you frame it in such a way like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's such a great uh, analogy because it's so easy for us to not just have one ball, <laughs> you know, that we're trying to throw, but we might be wanting to throw several balls uh, and think we can. Uh, while still jumping up and down on a trampoline uh, and eventually you drop the ball uh, and you trip on it and you land splat on your face on the trampoline you not only not accomplish the <laughs> task that you were trying to achieve but you've hurt yourself in the process so so I really I really do love that um, and you know Natasha Mogadis, who was on the on the show, um, she did exactly the same in terms of getting out of her uh, uh, um, burnout that she had, was experiencing. She she did exactly the same as you did, which was focus on 
cutting out caffeine, eliminating coffee, giving that up. And she had the same outcome as she knew that once she did that, it was achievable and she noticed a huge shift. And then she was able to take to, to, to make the, the other steps that were necessary to, to like you say, calm that uh, jumping up and down, down so that you can really focus on what you need to do and achieve what you, <laughs> you want to achieve. What did you notice for yourself personally once you got the ball rolling? When, when did you start to feel that snowball effect? I mean... Because you, you mentioned March the 13th. Yeah, in, in the beginning, I was just willing to learn and take uh -huh. on so much information that, you know, I was quite overwhelmed for some time sure reading, reading books doing you know courses the, the whole lot and I think once I had enough information and I saw that my actions were changing my outcomes that was the moment yeah yeah and I think it's so great that you can be aware, because awareness is really important to understand what how we influence ourselves. <laughs> is that awareness piece that your actions change your outcomes and you're no longer in a reactive state, but, but back in control of you? Yeah, so, I mean, I talk about being an inspirational leader and I refer to myself as an impact leader. Mm -hmm. Really what that means is just making such a big wave in the way that you do things, in the way that your life will change forever. So, you know, you can either walk into the sea and have the waves wash upon your, 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 your legs, or you can walk into that sea and have it part, you know, like in the the great stories from the from the Dead Sea. Um, I, I I just it really depends what you want in life, you know. Like I believe that you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it. Yeah. And so many people logically receive that process it and understand it but they don't go out there and use that for themselves because they don't believe it yeah now the only reason they don't believe it is because they haven't gone through the processes that i have in order to demonstrate to themselves that they can yeah. because once you start breaking all of these beliefs all of these barriers all of these, you know, things that you thought were important. There's a whole nother, it's not a world out there. There's a whole nother universe and galaxy <laughs> awaiting you. You know, <laughs> the stars are infinite. Yeah. And they shine right out of your heart. Like, you know, if you are living your purpose, if you are living in passion, if you are living to a point where you are not like, reacting subconsciously and you are consciously making decisions that are changing your outcomes immensely then there's going to be a lot of light shining from your heart and yeah. that effect that effect i mean you know we talk about impact that is the sea parting allowing you to walk straight through it there is no other way to define it it, it the impact is huge. And really, I've made that impact in my own life and I'm helping others to make it in their lives. And that's what I'm most passionate about. Yeah. And I, I love that analogy of the sea passing because you not only pass it for yourself, but you allow other people to walk through uh, and, and follow the path that you've done that is allow, uh, going to allow them to achieve, to achieve the results that they desire. That's being an inspirational leader, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone that saw you walking down towards the sea before the sea parted and you said to them, the sea is going to part, they're going to look at you like you're some crazy, 
<laughs> then when you walk down there and the sea parts, the other people behind you are like, he did it. He yeah. made it happen. How did he make it happen? I must find out. I must follow in his footsteps. That is the very definition of inspirational leadership. I love that. I love that. Gavin, what one piece of advice would you give to anyone who has uh, reached this kind of rut in their life and they're, they're kind of going in the, into a downward spiral and they, and they feel like they need, need to get out, but they don't, don't really know how? What one piece of advice would you give to anyone? I had so many thoughts going through my head as you were saying this. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just, oh, it, you know, I'm going to level with you guys. If you want to change your life for the better and you want to get better results and you want to feel better about yourself and, you know, live the life of meaning that you were meant to, like, get out of this rut, stop being stuck, stop playing out the old program. There is only one way. Walk in the path of somebody that has done it before you. Because if you go and try and do it yourself, you might, you might get there. You might. But what's going to happen is if you follow somebody else is you're going to collapse those time frames. You're going to get your results sooner than you want, which means you're going to be struggling less and you're going to be experiencing more joy. So whether it's with myself, Dr. Ruth Allen, or you know, any other coach or mentor that's been there and done it and has the knowledge and experience to help you. Like the main thing for me is they've got to resonate with you. Their character, mm. their personality, the way that they talk, the way that they express themselves, they've got to resonate. So, you know, as I said, me, Dr. Ruth, anybody out there, but do not be afraid to reach your hand out and ask for help. There is no shame, but commit at the same time to becoming a lifelong learner. Yeah, that is great piece of advice. Thank you for sharing that because, you know, it's about having the right guide. And like you said, resonating with you is being on that, being at that same uh, frequency so that when you're go about to go into a trough, <laughs> the person can pull you out quite quickly because they've been there and they'll be able to calm you down much faster because you are resonating at the same frequency. Just the amplitude is so much different. So thank you so much for sharing that. Gavin, how can people get hold of you to find out more about yourself and all the great work that you do and also about your swim? Uh, well, you can check out uh, the Stay Outstanding podcast. It's all about mindset. So we're across many platforms, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Uh, Stay Outstanding podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And I have a group called the Stay Outstanding Tribe on Facebook. You can email me, Podcast at gmail.com. There will be links in our... Uh, shortly to be uh, released new website stayoutstanding.com and of course if none of that was intelligible for you just get in touch with Dr Ruth and I'm sure she'll point you in the right direction <laughs> and they'll all be in the show notes and we'll put the link to your fundraising page as well in the show notes for your for your fantastic swim to raise awareness of uh, the plastics in the ocean and the, important, the importance of us collectively making an impact and and reducing that burden on our on our planet gavin thank you so so much for your time it's been a fascinating conversation i've loved talking about the importance of of mindset and just remember everyone you are not stuck with the brain you have you have the power to change it and gavin has been amazing and showing us how thanks gavin thank you so much This broadcast is brought to you by WinCheck Studios. We are an all-in-one educational platform for podcasters that revolutionizes how hosts leverage content to increase engagement with listeners, downloads, and income.
we come together to focus on community, collaboration, and collective impact. For more information on how you can interact directly with our hosts, access exclusive live content with offers you can't get anywhere else from our official partners, join our purpose-driven community by visiting www.winject.com. If you're ready to build a career doing what you love, then we're ready to see you there. Thank <music> you.